Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and I am here in Cupertino, California, right across the street from Apple's headquarters. It's the end of the first day of WWDC, and the Vision Pro, the Apple Vision Pro, was just announced this morning, and I got to spend some hands-on time with it. In fact, I spent about 30 minutes in the new headset. Uh, unfortunately, they did not allow any uh, videography, recording of any kind, no photos during this demo, so I'm gonna have to paint a word picture with you. Go down some of the things that caught my eye, uh, some of the experiences I tried out, and my thoughts uh, after processing that experience for this half day. Still plenty of more questions to come. This thing isn't going to be available until early next year. Uh, let's get it out of the way. It's $3,500. So definitely not for a mainstream consumer audience. I'm not even sure yet who this is exactly for, whether it's the enterprise markets, whether it's the developers or folks who just have the money they want to spend. Uh, but they're calling this their most advanced personal computer yet. Uh, and they've definitely packed a ton of technology into it. So let's first start off by talking about the headset and what's built into it. Uh, some things that we kind of expected were gonna be high resolution panels. So they didn't give out resolution specs, uh, but they did say 23 million pixels across through two micro OLED panels. And if we do some math, that's gonna be more pixels, higher pixel density than even the big screen beyond, certainly higher than the meta. Quest Pro and the Quest 2, or maybe even the probably the Quest 3 that's coming out later this year, uh, even surpassing that of the Vario Aero uh, high resolution VR displays. We do a little bit of math, divide 23 million by two, so 11 and a half million per eye. And assuming they're using a rough you know, 4K panel, so 38, 40 pixels wide, then I'm gonna say it's probably a 3840 by 3000 pixel panel per eye. And so already much higher than the, like using big screen beyond an example, the 2560 by 2560 per eye there. Uh, custom optics, they're talking about a three element lens and I'll talk about my experience uh, with that and we can get to the, the demos. Um, and of course, an array of cameras. So outward facing cameras for SLAM, that's detecting the world around you, detecting your hands, the gestures you'll be making, as well as eye tracking and cameras to detect your facial gestures. So kind of like what we saw on the MetaQuest Pro, it's both outward and inward facing cameras to have augmented reality as well as capture your expressions uh, because avatars are gonna be a big thing. I'm sorry, personas using Apple's lingo and parlance. Um, the big surprising thing to me though was there's also gonna be a OLED panel on the outside that will represent your eyes and your kind of your expression to the outside world. They're not giving out specs again about this panel, but they did say it's behind a lenticular screen. And so while it's not exactly a light field, we can think of it as a multi-view display. So uh, while it'll have a rendered persona, an avatar of your eyes, tracking your eyes as you look around, if someone comes up to you while you're wearing the Vision Pro, your eyes, your image of your eyes will fade in, and whether they're coming from you, the left or right, they'll be able to see kind of a almost three-dimensional view uh, of where you're looking at so you can have conversations with them. They're also using ambient lighting to let people know kind of what the experiences are that you're using or to indicate that you're in a full immersed environment Again, they're not using the phrase virtual reality, they're calling these immersive environments. If you're in VR, let's call it, uh, it'll be indicated as such with this kind of indicator on this display on the front. The big curved piece of glass running on uh, two chips, so it's the M2 chip, the same thing that you'll find in the latest you know, MacBook Airs and uh, MacBook Pros, uh, as well as a new custom R1 chip, which is handling all the throughput, the I.O. We know with the, the AR headsets, especially those that use pass-through video, uh, they're gonna need a ton of memory bandwidth, a ton of input uh, processing to do all that gesture calculation, uh, slam tracking of the world, eye tracking, all that stuff. And in this case, custom built to minimize the motion to uh, photon latency. They wanna have no latency, but when you move and when you see things in the outside world to when you see it, and they're targeting a 12 millisecond latency, almost instantaneous. They didn't talk about refresh rate of the panel, 
based on my demo experience, I think it feels like a 90 hertz panel. And as I was using it and moving my head around, I did not notice any significant judder or smearing. And so they've definitely got the low persistent attributes uh, on these panels as well. Uh, the headset ergonomically presses to your face through a custom facial interface, and there are going to be different sizes and models of these. Uh, so not only is there a big foam pad, but also a gasket that attaches on that. It's modular, so you can have different thicknesses, uh, as well as different padding for your face shape. Uh, and then there's a kind of rigid bar, or they call it a, a flexible bar, but more kind of like watch band material, Apple watch band silicone material, I would say, uh, that has the speaker systems, the spatial audio systems built in, and then a mesh knit headband in the back that you tighten with one knob. Uh, the back of the headband felt like it was like between three and a half to four inches thick, and you want to cradle that to the back of your skull. And in the demo, I use, I actually also use a top strap. So while they didn't show the top strap in the introductory video, there is a top strap uh, that I think will be bundled in that would use for a better fit. Okay, uh, the demo experience. I'll walk you through uh, what I was able to do. And again, I was not able to, and not given permission to record video or take any photos, or record any of the conversations uh, I had. Uh, but I can relay the experience to you. So walking up to uh, this big uh, white building they had set up on campus next to their basketball courts, this demo, specific demo area, set up just to demo the Vision Pro. First thing I did was get my prescription checked out. So they took my glasses and put them under a uh, examining device to instantly get my prescriptions. And then they didn't show me what the magnetic prescription lenses that, that would be offered uh, would look like. The room, the demo room I entered already had them then already attached to the headset. Uh, I also did a face scan. So this isn't for the avatars or persona, didn't get to try that, but I did get to kind of use my, uh, use a kind of when you set up a face ID move the phone around my face uh, using a standard iPhone. And th this gave the system a rough approximation of my face size. So they would then choose the best facial interface to then put in the demo unit. And that was very quick. Uh, one last thing was also checking your ears. So it also did a scan of your ears and where they are. Um, and so that would uh, better calibrate their spatial audio. Uh, that was the, the uh, quick calibration or the quick pre-setup before I got into the room. And when I got in, they had the unit all set up. Now, the fit and finish, as I put this on, they told me to hold it from the front by the glass portion. And the weight, while light, it wasn't as light as I had hoped. There was a lot of this experience that was really gr good and really great, but maybe not as great as uh, I, I wish it could be. And that really started with the, the weight of the uh, device and the fit and finish. Uh, putting the, uh, the headset on and tightening that, putting the headband around the back of my head and then tightening it and tightening the top strap, I did feel that the facial interface wasn't getting in touch with my entire face, my entire brow. It was leaving a little bit of room on the bottom uh, and not touching my cheeks completely. And so they swapped out that pad to a new pad. And still, even then, uh, I was getting most of the pressure on my brow and leaving some room uh, on the cheeks where I would feel like I would want a, a more full seal, more surface area contact. Maybe I'm spoiled by using the custom uh, milled out or custom made facial interface that's in big screen beyond. But here, I definitely felt it was felt more like using you know a custom VR cover uh, pad on your Quest 2 um, or, or the Quest Pro. Now, once everything was secure, though, you know, it didn't feel heavy, but it didn't feel light either. Maybe again, I'm spoiled by how light the big screen beyond headset is. And that doesn't have all the array of internal tracking cameras or eye tracking cameras uh, that this does or the big piece of glass in the front that this does. Uh, but I did feel over the course of the 30 minutes, the headset drooping down slowly and I did have to push it up occasionally. So I think that fit is gonna be super important for comfort for long periods of use. As you've probably seen now, this thing runs off a battery that you have tethered and connected to the side and so on on the left side on the temple, there is a uh, disc. It's not like a quick mag MagSafe connector, so it wasn't easy to disconnect. Um, it didn't show me how to disconnect it either, but it had a knit cord that went to a kind of elongated phone-shaped battery, uh, which gives this unit two hours of battery life. They didn't give any indication either whether you could hot swap the batteries, uh, but they did say that you could plug it into mains power, shore power to run it indefinitely if you don't want to plug it into a battery and you're just using it at your desk. 
Um, so once the whole thing was set up, I ran through some additional calibration. This was eye tracking calibration, very similar to some of the eye tracking calibration I've used in like the Quest Pro. You look at a couple of dots that are moving and then I did some hand calibration as well. I put my hands in front of my face until uh, I saw kind of a ghostly outline of my hands. And one of the really cool things that this does well is it does occlusion for AR. So when the experience boots up, when the home screen boots up, it's not a full screen home screen. It's icons in a pass-through environment. This is not a VR device with pass-through optional. This is an AR device where the VR slash immersive environments are secondary to it. And they really want to emphasize that pass-through was the priority. So with uh, the two people giving me the demo in the room, I was able to look at them directly and chat with them directly. I was able to look at my watch and my phone and read things. And in terms of the, the pass-through image quality, it was good. I would say it's like the lower end of HD. One of the questions I got, does it look like 4K? Does it look like, and it's, you can't really equate it to that because it fills your entire you know, field of view, this pass-through, but um, it definitely wasn't crisp at the edges. Uh, so it had the kind of the kind of smudgy artifacts that you might get from you know, zooming into a, a cell phone camera. Um, it wasn't grainy, uh, but it had kind of like the post-processing smoothing out effects. Details all there, it, I just wouldn't call it like passable to the real world. It wasn't like a retina pass-through, which I know probably isn't possible right now with those outward facing cameras. The room was also very evenly lit, so it couldn't get any sense of its HDR capabilities, the exposure changes. It wasn't like I was gonna be looking out into the sun out a window as I've done with past demos. It was a very kind of evenly planned lit room, which is probably on purpose, although this is a headset that I'm told uh, they want people not only to be using in the house, in the office, in the living room, but kind of in the world, on airplanes, walking down the street, because it will do that tracking, the slam tracking, the room tracking automatically. So no part of this calibration process, this onboarding process, that I have to go kind of map out my room, that I have to do what, you know, draw a guardian, or tell it where the walls are, or do a, a look around. It was all doing that automatically in the background, and that is by design. Their experience is they want you to be able to walk into new environments, new rooms, and it will kind of automatically know, then figure out where the sofas and couches and, and walls are and surfaces are and and and, and then project the reproject the uh, the the pass-through image on top of that to get real stereo and real depth there. Uh, the hand occlusion I thought was really well done. I put my hand over icons and would perfectly cover the icons. And even when I was loading in some uh, the virtual environments, the full immersive environments, using that digital crown on the top right, uh, I would be able to see my hands and my arms as well. They wanted that to be a priority. There are two buttons on the top of the headset. One is on the right side, the digital crown, which again, you rotate to fade in and out of immersive environments, and you tap it to uh, go back to your home screen. You could hold and tap to realign your center. Uh, and then uh, the second button actually is for taking photos and capturing these immersive photos and videos, uh, basically VR 180 moments that you can then relive from the first person. Feel the view. I'm sorry, I didn't even get to the feel the view. I saw another thing where I was maybe a little disappointed once I put the headset on. I'm not sure because the eye relief uh, was accentuated because I put the prescription lenses or I have prescription lenses in there, but it definitely felt like a little bit of tunnel vision. It wasn't the ultra wide field of view. It wasn't wider than what you'd find in the valve index uh, when the, the headsets push up to you. So a little bit disappointed there, you're still gonna feel like you're wearing you know, snorkel vision, but clarity across the lens was there. You know, I could peer all the way across the entire field of view. Uh, and when I reached that sweet spot and the eye box is pretty big as well. No, um, there's no angular adjustment, just lateral adjustment to get it focused and uh, moving, even when the headset, you know, slipped down a couple of millimeters, uh, it wasn't like the sweet spot was gone and the whole thing got blurry and, you know, chromatic aberration everywhere. It had a pretty generous sweet spot uh, and eye box, uh, which is impressive for a three element lens system. Um, all right, let me go through my notes. The first app that they had me launch was the Photos app. And the, the whole process of launching an app bears talking about because this is their, their input solution. There is no controllers with the Vision Pro. Their input is with three parts, touch or gestures, 
uh, eye tracking and voice. And not those three parts independently, but by design those three parts working in concert. It's multimodal and it's context sensitive. And uh, one of the first things they told me is don't like ray trace, like move my hand and try to point at things I would do with existing headsets. Just relax my hand and tap my fingers together comfortably. You know, one of the things that uh, I've noticed with hand tracking demos on the meta headsets is ray casting while effective and working as a laser pointer and pointing at things, it can be fatiguing over time. It's not a thing I really want to do. And the, the natural resting pose of my wrist and my hands is way more comfortable. And that's what this headset, the Vision Pro, seems to be really good at, where I could just put my hand on my knee and literally just tap my fingers together and have them different orientations, and it would be able to see that and recognize that combined with my gaze tracking, looking at the icons and the menus and the sliders and the things to change the UI elements. And it became, it was just super intuitive. It became second nature for me to look at something and tap it to a point where I didn't feel like I was thinking about launching application, it was just so fast, almost felt like it was reading my mind a little bit. And I did try to test the limits of the hand tracking, putting my hand above my head and it could still recognize gestures there. It got to a point where I got so comfortable with it where I put my hands, kind of rested one hand over the other and occluded the camera to, to track the, uh, the gesture uh, to a point where I realized, oh, I actually have to let the cameras know because it felt like it was just reading my mind and I had to remember, yes, there are cameras looking at this. And I shouldn't actively occlude that gesture. But once I'm in the app, launching the app, tapping it, um, opening it, you know, pinch to zoom is kind of a very natural thing as they told me just try it and I would be able to expand pictures, open up pictures, hover over. One interesting thing is, you know, it's using your eye tracking, but there is no virtual cursor that, that moves around. There is no kind of circle or arrow that's moving around. Uh, when you land, when, you're eight, when your eyes land on something um, and your eyes are constantly moving, you can tell my eyes are constantly moving. When your eyes land on something, it's using its machine learning. It's using the models they've trained on and using the, 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 the tap targets or the hit targets to, and, and tuning that so that it kind of knows where your your what your intent is. It's trying to infer your intention with all these cues, and I thought it did a really good job of that. So I scrolled through some pictures. These are all photos that looked very high res, taken with uh, presumably a, a new iPhone. Portrait mode photos had telltale signs of portrait mode, um, and they all look super crisp. I mean, the displays looked amazing. The UI elements, I couldn't see any aliasing in the icons. Couldn't see any kind of dithering or anything as I zoomed in the photos. It's just silky smooth interface was just really felt more like a desktop experience than what we think of as a traditional mobile VR or AR experience. And that's that's credit to the silicon, the Apple silicon, the, the custom chips that they've made to run their hardware. Um, going into the spatial photos and video, they had some pre ones made. So some photos kind of look like a, a scene. You remember in the uh, movie Blade Runner uh, 2049 when the memory maker is creating these memories and creating these birthday scenes, it kind of felt like looking into one of those scenes. They're static shots or very uh, short video clips, but it was fully stereographic. They did some vignetting around the edges and you don't get full you know, parallax. So there's kind of the telltale skewing as you move your head aside. You're not necessarily looking around objects completely, but you're looking into this kind of 3D scene, a window into the past, honestly. And I think there's a lot of power in that. I've done some VR 180 capture myself using like a Insta60 a VR 180 camera and documenting my kids growing up and putting that just a VR 180 video, stereoscopic video from a first person perspective into a, even a VR headset and watching that, I think there's this powerful emotional element to reliving those memories. I'm really curious what that will be like when you start sharing these memories and have people wearing these headsets sharing essentially these 3D uh, videos, immersive videos from their lives um, and how powerful that will be. I think that's an undersold element of the keynote address that may be a really powerful use for uh, or compelling use for this headset and their headsets going forward. 
Now, going back to the main uh, home environment, you know, it's like a tile of icons. It's like your iOS or iPad OS home screen. You have the grid of icons, but once you launch them, you, there was a little bar on the bottom, kind of like it is in the, you know, in the, in the Quest interface, where you can drag and you can move things off to the sides. You can place a window on the left, uh, and you have basically as many windows as you want. And I was able to load up three or four at once, uh, which didn't seem to tax the system. So they, they're calling this multitask and it's running you know, laptop hardware, so it's not like iOS, we're using one application at once. Uh, environments, so this was the uh, the VR environments. These are volumetric spaces, the preload that you built in. They didn't talk about how you would be able to import any, so I presume at this point, they're kind of the preloaded ones or the ones that they distribute or the app developers may distribute, but once you load one up, uh, they kind of slowly, as you uh, move that digital crown, they can, the, the vignette closes in around you. And one of the interesting things they demoed here was the two people I was talking to, uh, if I looked at them, they would slowly fade in into the environment. And I didn't know if this was uh, context dependent where uh, they were maybe proximity based, they were getting closer to me and so they were fading through the environment or it was based on using their voice and, and, and hearing someone talking to you. But no, it's actually the system, the cameras will recognize that if you turn and a person is in your peripheral or in your field of view, a real life person will recognize that that is a person and they should be faded in, uh, which seems like a, a smart way to not have you disconnected from the real world. Uh, and at the same time, uh, presumably, the, your persona avatar will then surface to them as well so you can communicate. So a very neat application of that demo. Speaking of personas, I was able to do a FaceTime demo. So didn't wasn't able to create my own persona and the process of that would have been taking the Vision Pro and scanning myself, kind of like doing a face ID scan and then them gen generating an avatar using some of the, 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 the training models that they've done. And the FaceTime, the FaceTime avatar, ha I, I'd say, it, doesn't quite cross the uncanny valley. I could tell it's supposed to be near photo real. They do some things to kind of obscure that with some vignetting around, some adding some graininess, I think also, to the image that doesn't feel tack sharp, the avatar. And I pull the avatar, that window, that FaceTime window, right up to me to look close. And I could tell it was a, a rendered avatar. I mean, it had the skin tones and it had the details of the person. It was recognizing all their facial expressions, smiles, eye blinks. It was getting their hands as well, but it did the thing that I've noticed that sometimes happens even on the, the Quest Pro when you're in a uh, shared virtual space. It was, do, it was mistracking blinks and this avatar was blinking a little bit too much uh, to a point where it seemed a little bit glitchy. And so I'm not sure that's gotta be something hopefully they improve on, they have to improve on because you want there to, you, you can't have the uncanny valley. I mean, at that point, uh, you'd rather see, I, I don't know if you'd rather see just a static photo, an animated avatar, uh, they're really pushing for photo real and so that's a high bar for them to pass with these personas. Uh, also cool though was collaboration. So over this FaceTime demo, we were, then they launched a free form, uh, kind of a, a whiteboard with a bunch of different elements. And the person I was talking to was glancing in the direction of the whiteboard that I was looking at. Now they had prompted me to move their FaceTime window to the left. So maybe those all scripted and they were looking at that, but that's a not an easy problem to solve. You think about it, like I have no sense, they have no sense of my, my real space, I have no sense of their real space. So if we're, if we're sharing this digital whiteboard, the triangulation of where the whiteboard is relative to me and them kind of has to either be faked or we have to align it and calibrate it ahead of time. And it feels like it was a line ahead of time in terms of them prompting me to move the window. But it was kind of compelling watching them in the little window, looking at and gesturing at the whiteboard as they were manipulating things in the whiteboard. I could see it then reacting in real time, including 3D models. And 3D models here look so gorgeous at that high resolution screen, so crisp. They had an architectural model, it's casting shadows. I couldn't see again any, no jaggies, no aliasing. I could really see this being useful for shared CAD design, you know, enterprise design. So we've heard about VR headsets and AR headsets that's the potential of them, you know, Vario does this to, to be shared, shared CAD design, load up a 3D model of an engine, of a car. Uh, and this feels like a headset, a headset that's right for that type of collaboration. 
Uh, and then entertainment. So movie watching, you know, is, is going to be a big thing on this. They had me load up the Apple TV application. Uh, they announced a partnership with Disney Plus. So presumably there'll be uh, the app of the Vision OS and the Vision Pro equivalent of your Apple TV apps, as well as other other specific apps that can build in 3D elements. Uh, and they had me watch a movie. So I watched a clip of Avatar, uh, The Way of Water. And this is the first time in a headset where it was playing in 3D, stereo 3D, at a, at a extremely high bit rate. It felt like I was watching a 4K movie for real, and it was doing it at high frame rate, which it felt like the theatrical experience. I mean, that's still the high frame rate, 3D, uh, 4K experience isn't something I can even do with my big OLED TV at home. I can't get 3D on that, and I can't get high frame rate yet. That's not streaming yet. So for that to be possible and seamless here, at least in this clip, was really impressive. I was able to load up also a cinema environment. So it had kind of like big screen, you know, it had the real time lighting. Um, so that's nothing new, but um, the crispness of this. And hopefully they set a high standard for the quality and bit rate because a lot of app times I'll load up, you know, Prime Video or a Netflix app or something and in, in a headset and the streaming bitrate just doesn't meet the potential of what the displays can do. And so if Apple via the Apple TV or their partners can really set a minimum bar for resolution and bitrate, uh, that's going to be a really nice experience in headset. They didn't let me, though, try one of the things they were touting at the keynote, which was using iPad and iPhone OS uh, applications, hundreds of thousands that would be available uh, to use, and nor the virtual keyboard. And so while I was able to do you know, gesture input by tapping my fingers, and they are promising a whole suite of vocabulary of gestures that I'm sure we'll be talking about later this week at WWDC, one of the things that I was able to try is tapping a virtual keyboard or uh, manipulating, interacting with a, uh, a, a a projected version of an iOS application where touch is such an important part. Multi-touch is such an important part. They gotta have a version of that in a space, but without real haptics, how are they gonna translate that? And maybe they're still figuring it out, but it felt like they were not ready to show that yet, uh, That tr how you transfer those 2D interfaces. Nor, nor did they show me uh, the virtual test stop demo where in the keynote they showed a, an image or a a demo of having a MacBook and the system would be able to recognize that it's your MacBook instantaneously, no syncing up, and it would project then that virtual desktop environment. They didn't show that as well. Web browsing with Safari, they did let me try. So that was scrolling down and reading text. It was trying to show me that the text was crisp. And yes, the text was super readable and crisp. Um, Reminding me a little bit of that high resolution, that retina demo I used when I went to visit Meta's uh, Meta Reality Labs uh, last year. Can't do a direct comparison. I can't say whether this is, you know, in my time, I can't say it's going to be better than you know, the 4K LCD or OLED desktop display you have. Um, but the text was sharp. And one thing I did notice was that when I moved that Safari window further away or closer up, um, the text stayed the same size. They were scaling the DPI of the text based on how far the virtual window was away to, so you, the text would never be too small. Uh, so they're kind of locking in some of that. I could pinch in to zoom and make the text bigger and kind of pinch out, but as far as I wanted to shrink it down and pinch it out, it would always bounce back to a certain size. And so I think they're doing things, locking it into the OS so that there's never a, an opportunity to have text that's very uh, too small to read or to be illegible, uh, even though you can scale these windows up and down, make them take up more of the virtual space and the more of the virtual environment. Now, the last demo I did was called Encounter Dinosaurs, uh, and this was kind of reminiscent of one of those, you know, your classic AR demo where you look at the wall in front of you, the title of the application uh, launches, you get real shadows cast on that wall, and suddenly the wall opens up into a portal into a new space. And here they let me walk around, and I did the novice VR thing where I almost bumped my head into the wall because that space beyond the wall looked so fully rendered. It was so sharp. It was like a prehistoric land. Uh, they had dinosaurs walking around and then a dinosaur walked into the space. And here, it did not look like a cartoon dinosaur at all. I wouldn't say like Jurassic Park photo reel. It's, it's not like ILM models we're talking about, but definitely high-end PC 
graphics, so sharp, so crisp, high res textures, great animation. And I felt myself, you know, as jaded and as experienced I am with these demos, ducking under the tail as the dinosaur turned around and trying to get it right to its face and see the animation of its breathing. And it just was a really, really uh, great, compelling example of really the, the fidelity of that screen, the resolution, the pixel density of that screen. Um, again, not having to do any type of calibration for the room. They didn't give me any uh, applications where I would be projecting you know, holograms on tabletop surfaces or anything like that, uh, but I was able to comfortably walk around the space, didn't get any kind of geometric distortion, rewarping artifacts of reprojection that you've seen certainly on the Quest 2 and the Meta Quest Pro through their pass through. Everything just felt very clear, very natural, and that hand inclusion was just darn near Perfect. Uh, that then, and that was the wrap up for the demo. I want to spend much more time in it, explore the UI more. There's no indication of the diving deeper into the settings. There's a, a control a center that if you look up at a green dot, it will pop open so you can adjust and see notifications and, and, and brightness and, and, uh, and, and audio and level uh, like that. But it still feels very early. They're not ready to show a lot of that yet. And certainly maybe hoping for developers to build uh, upon whatever uh, developer kit they're going to be releasing um, for uh, Vision OS. I think that covers uh, the uh, demo experiences, the, the eyesight pass-through of the biggest question about, they didn't even let me see what the images on that external display would look like. Uh, the spatial audio sounded great. Um, battery life being two hours, they said it's through not just web browsing, but a variety of applications uh, and virtual desktop. I mean, this, that's gonna be a big test for this. If they want people to have keyboards, mice, or their laptops and have a large version, a virtual version of their, their desktop operating system in an augmented reality space, uh, that's something I'm gonna wanna spend more time with. And I'm not sure if we're gonna get to for, for a long time, because this thing isn't shipping until uh, next year. It's not even gonna be available to order until early next year. $3,500, I'm not gonna speak to whether I think it's worth it or not. I, it's Hard for me to imagine personally myself spending $3,500 uh, on any type of consumer electronic device, uh, but the hardware seemed very polished and the you know, Apple did what they do best, which is make really smooth, intuitive, cohesive uh, experiences um, using all their strengths of their, their hardware, their silicon, their operating system expertise, uh, and maybe their developer relations as well. It's Certainly fascinating, um, really, really enjoyed the demo. Very lucky to have it. If you have questions about the Apple Vision Pro Pro, please post them in the comments below. I'm gonna do more digesting of this information um, and making my way back home. But thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.